Well, good morning, everybody. So good to see you here today. If you're ready to worship our Lord, would you stand up right now? And let's join our voice in praising our everlasting God. All right, church, let's sing. Straight for us as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Straight for us as we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Strength arises, we wait upon the Lord. Wait upon the Lord, we will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong service a good upbeat song really get your blood flowing this morning make you happy and tap your toes right did it make everybody tap their toes okay just want to make sure we we're alive and ready to worship God this morning well we are excited that you're here and happy that you're here with us this morning and if you're visiting with us for the first time we want to extend a special welcome to you and let you know how happy we are that you have chosen to worship with us this morning and those on Facebook who are joining us this morning welcome to Eastside Baptist Church and we praise and worship God this morning we will have a great time doing that but before we do I want to introduce our speaker who's going to be coming when after the music is over after the song service as Joe Butler and his wife Amy are visiting with us this morning he was the pastor at First Baptist Church a year or so ago and then he left there and went to uh, Lake City at Parkview Baptist Church and was director of missions at Orange Park, Florida. And then he just retired from uh, Wachula First Baptist Church. And he said, but instead of using retired, they were redirected 
redirected now to Tallahassee, Florida. They've been there since May, and they're available and looking to see what God has in store for them next. So be in prayer with him as he, as he listens to God and does what God wants him to do, but also be in prayer for him as he comes and leads us in God's word in just a few moments. Well, if you are visiting with us for the first time this morning, we have a special gift just for you out at our welcome station. And after the service, if you would, stop by there and pick up your free gift. It's just a, a token of appreciation to let you know how happy we are that you are here with us this morning. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll continue with our service. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this day, Father. Thank you for the blessings in it, Father, just the beauty and the, and, and the majesty of today, Father. Father, thank you so much for the blessings that you give us, even though we certainly don't deserve them and we cannot earn them, Father. You just bless us simply because you are God. Thank you. Father, most of all, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on that cross for our sins. Father, thank you so much. As I think about that often, I think, wow, just for me, your son died. Thank you. Father, we turn this service over to you from beginning to end, start to finish. Everything that is said, everything that is done, every word that is uttered today brings honor and glory to you. And as we honor our teachers and our students there, fixing to start back to school, Father, we just pray a special blessing over them. Lead God and direct them this year, Father. And Father, we pray that they have a great year in all that they do. And Father, again, thank you for all that you do. Be with us. In your name we pray. Amen. It's not like it used to be when we were kids. The pressures, the expectations, the uncertainty. It seems like being young grows more difficult each year. And being a parent comes with an ever-increasing level of anxiety. God, as a new school year begins, we ask for your hand to rest on the shoulders of our children. May your presence be palpable, your wisdom accessible, and your glory undeniable. We pray you would guard their hearts, guide their steps, and keep them safe. As they walk the halls, may their eyes be fixed on you. When they're overwhelmed, grant them peace. And when they're uncertain, grant them understanding. Thank you for entrusting us with your creation. Now, as they go back to school, we entrust them to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. We certainly do hope that you will be in prayer for our students and teachers as they begin back. Our teachers have already been back a couple of days and our students are starting back Wednesday. So with that being said, I would like all of our teachers, school board employees, school employees, and students to please come forward. We just have just something to let you know that we will be thinking about you this year and that we'll be praying for you this year. So if you would make your way forward, teachers, homeschool teachers, homeschool parents, college, you work in the school system. Please make your way forward. Just a uh, token of our appreciation for what the teachers do each and every year. Certainly the, the praying for the students as they go back to school this coming year. They start back Wednesday morning. As soon as Brother Ricky gets through handing those out to the students, I'm going to ask uh, him and Eli to come to the stage. And I'm going to ask Eli to pray for the teachers, if he would. And then I'm going to ask Ricky, if he would, to come and pray for the students as soon as Eli gets through with the teachers. So 
if y'all could kind of move down here to the center, kind of move to the center a little bit, <laughs> so that we can pray over you this morning. What a great group of, of teachers and students we have. We know they're going to have a great year this year. So Brother Eli, if you would, pray for the teachers. And Brother Ricky, if you would, pray for the students. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we come to you this morning, Lord, um, lifting our teachers up to you. Lord, as uh, they face an exciting year of teaching our children, our students, our adults, Lord, at the college level. Lord, uh, we just lift them up, Lord. Um, you know, even though it's exciting, it's also challenging as well. The challenges they face each and every year. Lord, I just pray that you just guide them in what you would have them do during this school year. Lord, to be a light for you to these students. Lord, as they interact and are involved in these students' lives, God, I just, I just pray that you use them to be a shepherd in their lives. Lord, uh, we just are so thankful for what they do and, and the, the commitment in these students' lives, Lord, to teach them not only education, but also life skills as well. Things that they will take with them into their adult lives. So we are so thankful, thankful for uh, what you do in their lives. Lord, just bless them, Lord, as you know, the stressors of the year. Um, just be with them. And uh, we just uh, offer up praise uh, in, in thinking of, of what you have in store for this year. So we ask that uh, you continue to bless them. And uh, thank you for your son, Jesus, Lord. Because uh, uh, without that, none of, none of what we do would be worth it. We're so thankful for your son. We just uh, ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Heavenly Father, bless all the students that are present here. Students, Father, that are not present with us, prepare them, touch in their lives, Father. Bless even us as we continue to share the truth of Jesus Christ, those that are with us. And as we share that with them, bless our students to also share that truth as they trust in Jesus with others their friends, or maybe not necessarily friends, others that need to hear the truth. We pray for your protection, for your will to be done in our lives. Thank you for the safety you'll provide us with, that you will bless us, that we might honor by you this time. In Jesus' name. Thank you all very much. We appreciate it. appreciate all that you do and all the... the Lives that you're going to touch this year. There's the students and the lives that they're going to be touching this year. What a great opportunity. Be in prayer for them this week. Remember them in your prayers. We have our quiet time. We have our devotion time. And just whenever you think about it, I'm sure they would appreciate your prayers. Brother Ron. Amen. This song is so appropriate for our teachers and our students. It says, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I
special song for us this morning. Your heart will be blessed as they sing. I raise a hallelujah in the past of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah Louder than the unbelief I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive. Hallelujah With everything inside of me I raise a hallelujah I will watch the darkness flee I raise a hallelujah In the middle of the mystery I raise a hallelujah 
great time of worship and singing has been done today and I really appreciate Ron it was uh, good to see him after all these years and um, see so many friends today that um, we've known from we lived here years ago uh, we had a great time uh, seeing our kids born here some of them and um, just raising them up they're all on the grown side now but uh, Amy and I um, moved to Tallahassee I grew up in Quincy so Tallahassee was close with all of my rel relatives and had a brother and two sisters and all their families and had a daughter there and our sons moved up. So we um, decided that was the best place to go. Uh, our parents had passed away and didn't have anything left to go back to in Quincy. So um, we did. And I saw, I saw Dan, Brother Dan, at a trustee meeting at Baptist College. And he's, uh, I told him we'd moved. And he said, well, you're probably getting settled. And so a few weeks passed and he called me one day and said, hey, um, you know, we're kind of at a crossroads. Could you come fill in for us? So, I'm thankful that he asked me and, and get to come over here. It's not too far. Uh, it, it didn't, matter of fact, I got here about the time I left this morning. <laughs> but the problem is it's going to take me twice as long to go back. So um, that was the only thing. So we're glad to be here and see so many old friends and, and reconnect and um, just glad to, to share with you today. And um, we are uh, today looking into the book of the Revelation. We're going to look at several passages here. But we're going to start off with Revelation 4, and the songs today were very fitting because we're talking about worship and the wonder of worship. When John wrote the Revelation, uh, the Jesus he saw was not the Jesus he had walked with. It was a different Jesus. The Jesus that he leaned upon and was, uh, and was referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved was a little bit different. Now, he saw Jesus that spoke to the seven churches, and John oftentimes found himself on the ground as a dead man before Jesus because this Jesus was now uh, someone he had known, but now he saw him in a different light. So the revelation is Jesus gave it to him, and uh, the Holy Spirit made it known to him while he was exiled as an old man. He became aware of a different Jesus than the one that he had encountered when he was young and was a 
follower of Jesus. So we're in Revelation 4 this morning, and we're going to see some of the things that John sees as he's called up and uh, told to come into heaven. He's going to see some things and write some things about what is going to take place. So then he comes down to verse 9, and he's writing about the things he sees. And here's what he says in chapter 4 of Revelation, verse 9. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne. Here's what they say. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So we look at the trends in our churches today and the religious fads that seem to be catching on today, we sometimes wonder, where is the church going? I know when I started out in, in full-time ministry years ago, I'd hear some of the older pastors at meetings talking about how things have changed, and I could say the same thing today, because so many things have changed in the way we, we worship God and the fads and the trends that seem to steer us away from understanding who God really is. But we see here in the Scripture today a view of God that John gives us that shows us that worship is not what I can come and get out of it. And that's what people ask. Going to worship today? Oh, I don't get anything out of it anymore. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go get to the restaurant early. And, uh, you know, I might go and hear the singing and I might leave because I just don't get anything out of it. Well, if you come to worship to see what you can get out of it, you're coming for the wrong reason because worship is coming to give something to God. And as we were leading uh, the singing and the songs, it's something how God's spirit takes us and, and causes us to see him in a different light. And all the things that are going on in your mind and your head during the week can just become laid aside as you focus on him and worship him and you come to understand who he is to you. So it's not what I can get out of it, but it's what I come to give to it. God is worthy of our worship, and he, he calls us to worship him. Worship is something we come to give to God, not something we come to get out of the situation. And so we come to see John here talking about uh, seeing him as he is. And if my motive is selfish, I'll never worship God. But if my motive is humble and contrite and broken before God, he'll speak to me. One of the great uh, writers that I like to read through the years was a pastor in the Chicago area named A.W. Tozer. He was a missionary alliance pastor for many years, and many of the articles he wrote were written before 1960. And so even though he wrote them years ago in the, their, their newsletter and he, they published, uh, so many of his words are very cutting and, and true even today, even though he wrote them uh, way over a generation ago. He called worship the missing jewel of the church. You ever had a piece of jewelry and you're looking at it? And I haven't. Uh, you're looking at it and, and maybe there's supposed to be a stone in there and somewhere it fell out. Oh, my jewel is missing. What am I going to do? I can't go out. Everybody will notice the missing jewel. It may be on a brooch or maybe on a, a bracelet or something. Worship, he said, had become the missing jewel of the church. He goes on and says, God is trying to call us back for that which he created us to worship him and enjoy him forever. Well, how do you define worship? Well, the Old Testament Hebrew des describes worship as bowing down and doing homage before God. When oftentimes folks would worship, they would get on their faces, they would bow down and do homage. That's before a king, because God was the king. In the Greek, in the New Testament, uh, worship was often seen as giving service through sacrifice. And we would also, oftentimes when I grew up, we would talk about going to the worship service. Why was service put in there? Because worship was something that you are, God is using to cause you to see how can I serve him. It's not to get something, it's, it's to get something that God can help me to serve. So it's an attitude. It's an experience. Uh, it is, I believe it is intelligent. We have so many today that have let worship become mindless and emotional, but it is intelligent. It is full of our minds, and it needs to be something that we see as motivated by love. And we need to leave with a sense of 
being obedient to what God has shown us and God has revealed to us. Evelyn Underhill, in a book on worship, said, it is the total adoring response of man to the one eternal God self-revealed in time. It's personal, and yet it's passionate at the same time. Gypsy Smith was a British evangelist who came to America, and he traveled around America and, and to, throughout Britain. And uh, he was called Gypsy because he, he was raised like a gypsy, but this British evangelist came to know the Lord and spent years of his life. He started at 17, and he spent years of his life preaching until he was 87 years old. And even up to the time he died, he had preached just a few days before because God gave him the strength to go that long. He was being interviewed when he turned 87, and the interviewer asked him this question. He said, you started preaching at 17. Your preaching was simple. It was colorful. It was original. And then, uh, you know, you've come to now the age of 87. You're still preaching with the same power and the, the same energy you had when you were younger. What's the secret uh, of your freshness into your older years? He said, I never lost the wonder. You know, sometimes when folks get to doing something, they lose the wonder of what it's all about. Remember when you were young and you played baseball, it was fun? Then all of a sudden people started pushing you. Hey, you might get a scholarship to college. Maybe you can get into the major leagues. I've never seen so many potential major leaguers in the last few years of my life. Oh, you're a great soccer player. Oh, you're a, you might get to play at a major college. And everybody thinks that some, and the fun goes out of it. And all of a sudden we wonder sometimes what it's about. And, and sometimes even when I hear some of these major league baseball players talk, they, say, they, they sometimes seem so serious, but sometimes they get out there and they say, you know what, we have to just realize we're getting paid millions of dollars, but we're having fun. And that's what it should be about. There should be a, an element of wonder, an element of, of something that never goes away. And true worship involves wonder. I'm not meaning that it's this fun, but it's that, that it's exciting and there should be a joy in it, not a, not a sad face. You shouldn't come in here and, and look like, you know, you just lost your best friend or something like that. So anyway, we look at, we look at worship. And it's, there's, a, there's a rare ingredient of wonder that is missing in our worship. Worship to most Christians is very explainable. I don't mean we have to get crazy, but I mean we, exp we can explain everything that happens. We can, we can lay it out in a very, ex uh, a very understandable, explained way. There's no element of mystery or of the unknown. We sometimes think that when we do something, we have to know everything and we have to understand everything to be a part of it. But you can't understand everything. You can't explain everything when it comes to understanding how God works. A uh, journalist who became a Christian years ago, uh, 100, over 100 years ago, G.K. Chesterton, he said, the world will never starve for lack of wonders, but for lack of wonder. And uh, he is very true. Uh, we live in the area of being everything explained. It's amazing when Isaiah wrote chapter 9, verse 6, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Let's look at what John saw today because he sees Jesus in several ways, and this is what gives him a great sense of wonder in his worship. We looked at chapter 4 and see the first thing he sees Jesus as here. It's very uh, interesting because when you read this, you almost pass right over it when you're thinking about how he describes uh, the Lord Jesus and how they, uh, they sang and what he heard they said in heaven and they cast their crowns before him. But he comes to verse 11 of chapter 4 and here's what he says. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. Wow, that's great. Then he says this, for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Now, the evolution debate has gone on for years, and there are some who think it's over, and I, I'm looking forward to, in my time away as a full-time pastor, to go to that art exhibit up there in the middle of the country. How in the world they got that thing there from the ocean, I'll never know. But anyway, Ken Ham and others built it there. Some of you may have gone to it, but I would be, I would be amazed to go and see that, and I am going to do it one day. Uh, my cousin had a birthday back in June, and uh, I gave him a birthday card. I was a little bit late. I gave him a birthday card, and on the birthday card, it shows the ark floating away. There were two unicorns standing on a piece of dry ground, 
And one unicorn looked at the other and said, was that today? Well, sometimes you might be a little late, but the ark is a reminder and of how God brought everything about, how he recreated everything after he destroyed the earth with a flood. But we live in a world where folks want to describe how God did it, the way he did it, if God did it. Do we come from primordial soup? Do we come from a, a sludge pond? But where did the sludge pond come from? On and on. But here, very plainly, John doesn't have a debate about it. He says, all things were created by you and by you all things exist. He's the creator, and you never need to lose the fact that God is the creator, and we need to see him as the creator of everything. When I travel around the countryside, I, I, liked, I was born in the woods, and so I, not literally, but I was, I was born around the woods, and I just love to be out in, the, out in the woods. I don't like to be surrounded by tall buildings and that sort of thing. Lived in a variety of places, and always loved to just look at all the things that God, and you know what you see when you see creation is you see a window or you see a mirror. Because you see through that there's a God whose hand was behind all of this. Or you look back and say, wow, look at what we've done. And that's not the way it is. Believers are looking through a window and see a creator. Unbelievers only see a reflection of themselves. That's why what Paul said in Romans 1 is so true. He said down in verse 20, these words, for his invisible attributes, namely, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so they're without excuse. In verse 21, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Verse 25, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Our world has turned its focus on itself and not on the one who created us all. He is the creator of all things, and there's wonder in that. And if you ever lose the sight that God has created all things, and folks can give you all kind of arguments about the uh, climate and about the evolutionary aspects, they can give you arguments about the um, what's happening in our world, and, and the world's going to end in a fire one day, but it's not going to be like the world thinks. God is the one who created it, and I think sometimes we are so mistaken to think we can control so much of what happens, and we really can't. I mean, we, we, uh, we can do so many things, but we can't stop hurricanes and storms and tornadoes. We, we don't do that. And so we understand that, that man focuses on himself rather than the creator, um, Psalm 119, or Psalm 19, not Psalm 119. Psalm 19 describes the creation this way, and this is the way the world sees the creation oftentimes. The heavens declare the glory of God. Well, they just see the heavens. And the sky above will claim his handiwork. We see the handiwork. They just see the sky. Day to day pours out speech. Night to night reveals knowledge. There's no speech, nor are there world, words whose voice is not heard. And so they look at the world and they only see, well, it's like the, the guy that was uh, talking to a guy on a plane one time. And uh, he, the, 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 he said, uh, what do you do? He said, I'm an astronomer. Oh, really? And he said, what do you do? He said, I'm a preacher. He said, well, huh. I see preaching as pretty simple. I mean, basically, do nice, be nice, love your neighbor, do unto others as you have them do to you. I mean, uh, God is love. That's pretty much it. And he said, well, the preachers see what you guys do is pretty simple too. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. And you can look at the world through different perspectives, and if you see God as the creator rather than us, the cre creature, as the great one, then you'll, you'll miss what God is doing. And we need to see John saw him as the creator. He made us, not we ourselves, as Psalm 100 says. And so we come to understand we enjoy creation. We don't exploit creation. And uh, we're faithful stewards of his work. But if you want to have wonder in your worship, see God as the creator. Notice what else he says. In uh, chapter 5, he jumped over just a page. We see him, secondly, as the Redeemer. In chapter 5, down in verse 9, notice what John sees here as he sees the uh, vision of what's shown him. He says in verse 9, and they sang a new song. And every time Ron tries to teach us a new song or teach you a new song, or I go to church and they want to sing a new song, what do we do? Oh, goodness. 
We don't want to sing a new song. Guess what? We get to heaven, we're going to sing some new songs. All the songs are going to be new. Well, they sang a new song. John said it wasn't one he knew. It wasn't one of the old ones. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nations. You have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Wow, what a story there. He didn't say, um, you're such a wonderful person. Who's wor-. He said, you were slain by your blood. People were ransomed for God. Sins were forgiven from people all over, not just people from Northwest Florida, but from people all over. God has saved people all over the world of every tribe and every language. He's done those things, and he's made them a kingdom, a priest who declare his glory. We must see him as the Redeemer. Christ is central to our understanding of God. When we come to worship and we worship Christ without the cross, then that's just pure idolatry. Because what we do is we say, I love Jesus. And let me tell you, this is never more, never more displayed than at Christmas time when people are saying, Oh, the sweet little Jesus in the, the manger, the little baby Jesus. Who doesn't like a baby? I like babies. My daughter's going to have a baby pretty soon. We're going to go see him, her. It's not going to be him. It's going to be her. They, they're supposed to know that sort of thing now. And you know what? That baby makes you smile. And that baby, and all it does is make a messy diaper and cry. And it can't talk. It has no teeth. And you got to tend to it all the time. But what a wonderful thing. And so at Christmas, everybody, oh, we ooh and all over the baby. But we don't see him as the redeemer. I love to worship the Jesus of the manger, but I don't want to worship the Jesus of the cross. The cross is where he was slain, his blood was shed. The cross is where he did something for us we could not do for ourselves. So we worship God for who he is and where he is and what he has done. See him as the creator, see him as the redeemer. Look in Revelation 11, see a third thing. See him as the king. Chapter 11, verse 15 John sees some more things to write down, and here's what he says in verse 15. As he sees Jesus as the king, then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. He shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on the thrones before before God fell on their faces and worshiped God saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged. And for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, those who fear your name, both small and great, for destroying the destroyers of the earth. Then chapter 19, down in verse 16 He adds this word here when he says, describes Jesus at the end when he comes and all things are brought to a conclusion. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. He didn't say Jesus is going to be the prime minister, the president, the one in charge, the lead person. No, he's King of kings and Lord of lords. And we see him as the redeemer. We see him as the king. We see him as the creator. And we come to realize when he comes, he reigns supremely. Sometimes when a person comes to reign in a country or nation, there are pockets of dissent or pockets of rebellion or pockets of places where the king doesn't have control. When he comes to reign, there will be no places like that. He reigns supremely. And when he comes to reign, he will reign righteously. It isn't going to be that there's some who say, well, he favors this group over the other. No, there will be a righteous, righteous rule that will take place. There will be no one who, who is uh, treated differently than the other. All will be treated and all will be viewed through what he, how they responded to him who shed his blood for them that their sins might be forgiven and rose to live within his people. He is the king over all. And he will reward righteously. I don't understand all about the rewards, but I do know this. God will reward his people one day. He will give us according to how we lived our life 
for his glory. It's not a reward to say whether you go to heaven or hell. It's a reward to say how you've lived your life as a child of God and how you have brought glory to him in what you've done. But there's a fourth way, final way I want to show you. And there's more than this, I know. But there's some that John mentions here in Revelation I want to point out to you. This one is as the bridegroom. We're in chapter 19 of Revelation. And the fourth way he mentions him is as the bridegroom. This is almost a strange way to see Jesus because we often view him as the bridegroom. But we know that as the church, we are the bride of Christ. And... Um, We'll be presented without spot or blemish one day. Won't that be something? Because there's a lot of spots and blemishes now. I can't understand that. He's going to bring us to himself, and he is going to be the bridegroom. You know, whenever there's a wedding, and I've done a lot of weddings. Matter of fact, we won't talk about that. But anyway, I, I notice that everybody focuses on the bride, and whenever I, I'm talking to the, the, the crew about how we do things, and she walks in the door, I said, everybody, if we have the rehearsal, you take and you look your eyes upon her. She walks down the aisle. She's the focus of everything. But you know, on this day, the bridegroom is going to be the focus, not the bride. Oh, the bride will be, be important, but the bridegroom is how he's described here in chapter 19 of Revelation. Down in verse 4 of chapter 19, he says, And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah. For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of all the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who were invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Well, that's quite a story. We only have one of our children that's married. Our daughter, Lydia, who was born back in 91 when we were here. She, she had her birthday last Sunday. She was 31. She lives in Jacksonville. And we have a little granddaughter. Some of you have seen her on Facebook. And uh, Lydia is about to have another baby here in about the 1st of October. We're excited. Um. Anyway, I remember when she got married, I was living, we were living in the Orange Park, Jacksonville area, and uh, it was in 2013. I, she said, Daddy, I want to get married, and she was just a freshman, and uh, so I told her and Kenny, I said, when you graduate, you can get married. Well, when her AA was about to be done, she said, Daddy, I'm about to graduate. I said, no, 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 no. When you graduate, you can get married. Well, she struggled, and she worked, and she got it done, and you know what? She said... Daddy, I'm going to get married on December 14th. I said, when do you graduate? Well, I'm skipping graduation that day. And uh, so she got married on the day that she was supposed to be graduating. They just mailed her her diploma. And so I said, okay. And so it came about. And so we went through what we're going to do. She said, Daddy, I want you to give me away, and I want you to do the wedding. I said, how in the world am I going to do that? Well, we got ready. We did it all. And so I talked to one of my pastor friends. We had it in his church. And so... I walked her down the aisle, and boy, there she was, just as poised as ever, as she always has been. And uh, she walked in, and there was Kenny waiting down there with all the, the bride, bride's maids and the, the groomsmen standing down there. And there was Kenny, like he had a big case of allergies. His eyes were watery. His nose was sniffing. I thought, what's going on with the boy? And he was just losing it up there. And uh, we walked in, and she, everyone was focused on her, and she walked in, and we got down, and the pastor said so few words. He said, who gives her? And I said, her mother and I. And so I handed her over to Kenny, and then he came down, and I went up, and we did the wedding. It was a great time. What a spectacular event it was. It was a wonderful thing, and I have such great joy remembering all of that. But one day, there will be a wedding like no other. You remember, I remember I got married in 1981, and you know, the funny thing is, uh, weddings have really changed. You used to get married in church, now you get married in a grove or a barn or a 
shot or something like that. I don't know where all that's going. And they charge a pile of money for it. Well, I think I'm going to build a shack and have weddings in it. You might make a lot of money doing that. Well, anyway, uh, that summer, Princess Di got married. It was the wedding of the century. Everybody was talking about Princess Di getting married to Prince Charles. And, uh, I mean, what a, it just changed the face of weddings. There's a wedding like no other coming. It's going to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, you know, it's interesting that when, when John tells of this event there in chapter 19, he comes down and, and, and he says something there in verse 9. This, he said, the angel said, write this down, John. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, you're thinking to yourself, everybody's invited. Initially, they may be. Some people may question you and say, hey, did you get an get a invitation to such and such event? No. Oh, and they don't want to say anything because they are not sure why you didn't get an invitation. Or maybe it's to the wedding, you didn't get an invitation. But you want an invitation to this one. Matter of fact, I want to ask you, have you received your invitation? Because you should have received it. If you're going to the wedding, if you even though it's it maybe way off, you better make sure you've got your invitation. You better make sure that you've received it and that you have responded. You've RSVP'd this invitation. He said, blessed are those who get this invitation. It'll be like no other. These are the true words of God. Jesus is the bridegroom. The church is his bride. Well, when you think about worship, it always should be a place of wonder. We should see him as he is. Don't come to see everybody else as they are. Come to see him as he is. Vance Havner tells a story, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't tell a Vance Havner story for the sake of some folks here today that say they're so tired of hearing about Vance Havner. Vance Havner told a story years ago about a man who was on a train. He was looking out the window, and, and every few minutes he was just commenting on what he saw as the train went through the countryside. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, my goodness, wonderful. Oh, look at that, wonderful. All the passengers began to get a little bit concerned about what was going on with this man. Harry was sitting in his seat, glued out the window, and all he could do was say, wonderful. Oh, that's something. Never seen anything like that before. And finally, after a little while, one of the passengers got up enough nerve to go over and ask him, say, hey, uh, we're sitting here pretty bored as we travel across the countryside, and you're looking out the window. You know, you're seen to be enthralled with everything you see. What's, what's, the, what's the thing? What's the situation? Here's what he said. Until just a few weeks ago, I was blind. But someone told me about a doctor in a great city that could perform an operation that could give me my sight back. And he said, and I went through this process, I had the surgery, my sight returned after years of being blind. And he says, as I look out this window, I'm headed home, and everything I see, he said, what is ordinary to you is wonderful to me. Don't let worship become so ordinary that you don't see the wonder. Have you lost the wonder of worship? Because if you lost the wonder of what it means to know Christ and to understand who he is and to have him uh, real and, and fresh in your life and like, like Gypsy Smith. I never lost the wonder. Don't lose the wonder. Let it always be something that enthralls you and amazes you and still makes you just get excited all over again about what God is doing. Would you pray with me with this morning? In just a moment, the praise team's going to come and sing and God's going to be um, working some of your hearts and there's a few moments here where you could come down. I'll be here. Bill will be down here. And you can come down, and if you want to pray with us or you want to talk to us about something, you want to nail down some things that have been going on and you aren't sure about your relationship with God and you want to ask some further questions, we'll be here to talk with you. And as they sing, they're going to sing a song, The Savior is Waiting. The invitations have been sent. Are you going to RSVP? Have you received your invitation? God's calling you today. You come and you say yes to him who said yes to the cross. So, Lord, speak to us now. We pray that this time this morning might be a time of searching, that your spirit might do the work within us that only you can do. Bring us to that place where we have surrendered our all to you. We recognize that there's nothing in our life that is worth holding on to that compares to knowing you and living for you and 
going to be with you one day. So, Lord, have your way in this time. We pray that you work in hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as God speaks. You step out right now. The Savior is waiting to very much as we've always said never get the invitation is never closed we're always here we're here in the office this week you know talk to someone who you know is a christian if you have anything you, you need or anything we can do for you please let us know the invitation does not end when the church service ends but it's an ongoing invitation so please remember that thank you for that message we appreciate that i just have real quick announcements to make uh don't forget the centennial celebration it's next Saturday from 10 to 6 at the fairgrounds. Uh, we'll be there from, like I said, from 10 in the morning to 6 in the afternoon. Uh, we're going to have a couple of games and a couple of fun things going on out there. So come by. And if you haven't signed up or you'd like to sign up, I think there's one slot available. So make sure you sign up for that. Uh, don't forget, also, summer enrichment ends Tuesday. I know Brother Grady told me this morning he was tired. But he said he's had a great summer, great summer this year, and they have had a good time this year. 
Uh, but with that being said, we need to one more time move those chairs over there on that side and just push them back to the back. And if you could, Tuesday, if some people could be here Tuesday at 4 o'clock, we're going to transition the uh, dining room back the way it was, get the big tables out, put them up, get the small tables out, because we're going to start Wednesday night suppers back this Wednesday night, the 10th. So I know we're excited about that. So be in prayer about all those activities that are going on. Brother Ron? Yeah, let's sing a closing song. Here's one we all know. Amazing Grace. Amazing. God bless you, you're dismissed.